Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. Hey, everyone. So I hope you're doing super well. And uh, thanks for listening to this podcast. I think this is an area uh, that, uh, you know, a lot of people have been asking for some help with. And um, I finally got around some time to really carving out and just summarizing maybe my thoughts on prehab and sharing with people um, maybe what I think is useful and kind of some other ideas around, you know, what they can do to better understand it. Uh, I think prehab is one of those things that everyone kind of knows that is important and that they should be doing. And because, you know, gymnastics and many other sports are so challenging on the body that a lot of people do want to stay ahead of injuries or just keep athletes as healthy as possible. Um, but also these things do carry over to performance quite a bit as well. So I think it's something they know that is very important. They want to do it. But I think two things happen sometimes. One is that they Kind of, kind of step onto the internet or they look on social media and they try to get some ideas uh, for things to do. And what they get is a, a lot of random different exercises that may be good. Some may be others uh, better than others, but they essentially get just like a ton of stuff to do. And they're just throwing in random drills at practice here and there and there. And I think that, you know, the intention is great. I really do think that those people are obviously doing a wonderful job trying to help the athletes, but um, that kind of shotgunning, you know, scattered uh, approach is maybe not the most systematic and effective. So that's kind of one thing that might be challenging. Two is I think sometimes when you step into this little rabbit hole, sometimes it gets really wild on social media and other areas about what prehab is and what it isn't. And it's just so complicated sometimes with uh, injuries and complex around, you know, what things are helpful, what things are not. And so I think what happens is people just get really overwhelmed and they kind of throw their hands up, right? And they're like, all right, you know, this is this is a little bit too hard to deal with. And so I understand that, you know, if I was just a gymnastics coach or the everyday person just trying to do some things to take care of myself and I didn't have a medical background, when I looked on social media or if I followed someone's advice who was saying all these fancy terms and all these geeky things, and I was like, I just want to find five to 10 things to do in a circuit that are helpful for me um, or the athletes that I work with, you know, I, I too would be very overwhelmed and I'd, I'd probably get frustrated and throw my hands up too as well. So um, I think there's that kind of spectrum, which is like the maybe getting way too much information kind of coming out of a fire hose. And the third problem that might come up too, as I think about it, is I think sometimes people go really way, way, way too far down the rabbit hole and they think that, you know, pre exercises are the golden answer for everything. And so they just get obsessed with doing really either, you know, overly uh, complicated drills or doing too much of them and just really not thinking about good, solid, basic training principles. Um, so yeah, my hope is that by sharing these things, um, I can maybe just summarize the last 10 years of what I've found useful uh, and hopefully give people some guidance. So um, prehab is for those that are not familiar, stands for preventative rehabilitation. And I think in unfortunately in that idea and in that nomer it already starts to be a little bit uh slippery slope and i think it's important to, to understand this right but I'll, I'll talk about that in the next moment but the prehab essentially is using exercises or interventions or you know certain things to hopefully try to stay ahead of injuries or reduce the risk of injuries right so um, either acute injuries like, you know, somebody, uh, you know, tearing an ACL or like an overuse injury of a stress fracture or somebody who has like some growth plate irritations, um, severs disease, stuff like that. So the intention with prehab is that, okay, well, when you're in rehabilitation, you're doing all these exercises to hopefully rehab your injury and get you back to your sport and get you back to gymnastics. Um, so why don't we use these in a proactive manner when people are healthy? And I think it's a wonderful idea and I believe in it. And I think it's awesome. Um, but I think the problem here is, is a couple of things is unfortunately it slides into, you know, some miscategorization or some misunderstandings about prehab. So what prehab is not right is it's definitely not a magic bullet, right? You cannot just use exercises um, preventatively um, and, and think that you're going to not have problems, not have issues, not have uh, crankiness come up in joints or not have injuries happen that are just very, very um, out of the blue or over time, right? injuries in the human body are unbelievably complex. Like as someone who studies these things extensively and works with many, many high level experts in the field, we still really find it's challenging to really pin down exactly what causes X injury or Y injury, right? It's so complicated and sports are so complicated themselves that many things factor in this all the way from, you know, one side of the equation, which is like sleep, nutrition, hydration, uh, and periodization all the way to the other side, which is like literally a freak accident, right? Just like thought my hand was here, my hand was not here. <laughs> it's simply just a complete risk uh, sport, right? And things just happen. So from the very outside the sport uh, lifestyle things all the way to the in the sport uh, accidents um, and everything in between, right? It makes it extremely complicated. And I think as someone who likes rehab and enjoys rehab and helps people with rehab, 
I don't think that it's going to be a magic bullet. And I think it's really important to level set that expectation really, really early. Okay. And on the back of that, prehab is not going to fully prevent quote unquote injuries, right? And that's why I think that misnomer of preventative rehabilitation is a little bit funky because I don't think that no matter what you do in the perfect program, you can't prevent all injuries. I think, again, sports are risky. Life comes with risk, right? I could walk down my stairs and roll my ankle just looking, you know, the other way. Things just happen, right? And I think it's really important to, to keep that mindset fresh that, because I'm doing these rehab exercises in a preventative measure, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. What we're trying to do is reduce the risk of injuries. And I think that's really where you have to center your kind of language and center your terminology is by hopefully doing some things. And there are some good research studies that talk about this. By doing this or understanding this injury, we can change certain things or stay ahead of certain things and reduce the risk that something serious is going to happen or reduce the risk that an overuse injury becomes really, really bad and really hangs somebody up. So it's about reducing risk, right? And it's also hopefully about reducing the severity of some injuries should they occur, right? And I think sometimes this comes up in gymnastics with landings, right? So you have someone who doesn't really have a great strength program and doesn't also do anything preventatively and is kind of just like, you know, chucking their body around. When they land sometimes really, really heavy, it might put a lot of pressure on certain structures and those structures can over time become painful. Uh, hopefully, if we reverse engineer that and we get a good strength program, we do some proper landing mechanics, we understand how to do some preventative exercises to teach those landing mechanics and get them their legs very strong, particularly maybe landing on one leg. The hope is that if something should happen, uh, either maybe we stay ahead of the curve and it's not as bad or it's not as severe if it does happen. Okay. So yeah, I think prehab itself is the cultural um, understanding of the concept of using things in a proactive manner, but preventative rehabilitation is a very, very uh, challenging thing to kind of uh, wrap your head around. And I think, well, again, we're reducing risk. Uh, we're trying to stay ahead of things with risk and with severity and with some other pieces, not completely wiping out the chance that no one's going to have injury. Okay. So that's kind of the second thing. The third thing, which is really important for the gymnastics community to hear is it is not a replacement for actual medical care. Okay. And growing up in the sport, things are much different now than 10, 20 years ago, but there was definitely some times when I saw or happened to me where somebody would uh, have uh, an ankle that was uh, painful and they landed, right? They would land short, the front of their ankles would hurt really bad. And it would kind of get to the point where they couldn't really train anymore. Uh, and they couldn't really do too much. But in that situation at that gym, unfortunately, the solution was go do your TheraBand exercises, right? Go do your ankle stretches, go do your calf raises, right? And people were thinking like, if I just use these exercises, it'll make the pain go away, right? That person is not in a preventative uh, silo. <laughs> they are in a rehab silo, right? That person has an injury, that person has pain. So I don't want people to think that they can, you know, my daughter, or my son, or this athlete that I'm coaching has back pain. I can just listen to Dave and do these prehab circuits and I can skip the PT, skip the AT, skip the doctor, right? That is very unethical, <laughs> but it's also extremely dangerous. Okay, so what I'm talking about in the next kind of 30 minutes is aim to be, we have a program with a lot of really active people and we're trying to stay ahead of problems that uh, you know, we think are common in the sport, back pain, ankle pain, um, you know, some issues with shoulder rotator cuff injuries. Uh, we're trying to use the research and use the experience we have to stay ahead of these things um, and hopefully reduce the risk of them happening or the severity of them when, if they do come uh, instead of, you know, just like snapping your fingers and thinking like, oh, my shoulder hurts, I'll go do my prehab circuits and I'm fine. Okay, that's not going to work. Uh, AT, PT, uh, you know, medical doctors, multiple years of training, multiple years of credentialing to really understand that there are very similar looking injuries or pains that are completely different, right? And I can tell you in the shoulder, for example, you could have shoulder pain in the front for 13 different reasons and have nine different solutions for each of those, right? And so like, it's, it's very hard to say, my shoulder hurts in the front. If I do all these shoulder exercises, I'll feel better, right? And I really want to make that clear um, because it's, it's just important that people understand their scope and where they operate. Even if you're a medical provider, you know, you don't want to be giving these out as just, you know, preventative things that are really low key should be rehab. So I understand finances and time and travel and all those things are challenging. But unfortunately, this is not a situation where you can just kind of like, you know, squint one eye and look sideways and kind of make it work because uh, it's very dangerous if it, if it goes on for too long. So yeah, the last thing I want to say before we dive into some actual concepts is that prehab itself is not enough. Okay, so I fully believe in the ideas that I'll talk about, obviously, and I think it's important, but it will never be a replacement or do its job if the culture and the communication at a gym is not there, right? You can do the best prehab work in the entire world, but if someone comes up to you and says they're back pain and you maybe don't take that seriously or you kind of say like, it's okay, just keep training, you know, it's just growing pains, right? If you just write that off and someone's really having an issue, that's a problem. That's a culture and a communication problem. So 
You need to have very open dialogue, very transparent, talk about the injuries, talk with rehab providers, talk with doctors, talk with parents. You need to work really hard to have those things in place. Um, that's like, you know, in my mind, that's like putting icing on just a plate with no cake, right? If you don't actually bake a cake as the base, then how can you put all these things on top of it, right? So that's not going to go well. So that's kind of the first thing. Number two is it won't replace just a good training plan. You know what I mean? Like a lot of these uh, overuse injuries in particular sometimes are issues with like workloads and training management and programs and not understanding kind of like light and medium and heavy days. So if you don't understand workloads or a training plan or have a plan and a program to follow over multiple weeks and throughout a season, um, you're going to keep having issues. You're going to keep having, you know, cranky joints, stuff like that, because you're not really thinking about how the human body works to adapt. And obviously that's not what we're going to talk about here is to go way down that, uh, you know, path, but um, it's not going to work, right? If you just do prehab programs and use them when things start to get cranky, um, it's not really going to be effective because you're you're really running uphill at, at a giant snowball, right? So like it's going to be challenging for you to make progress and, and feel like you're making a, a difference um, or being positive with your rates of injuries if those things aren't in place, right? So culture, communication, a good training plan, that stuff's really important. And I have to mention this one next for the coaches in here is that a lot of these things do really depend on some outside gym factors. So parents are a huge role here. So sleeping, uh, having a proper hydration, having uh, proper nutrition and fueling yourself properly before, during, and after workouts, um, and also really making sure that you have time management skills to get your homework done and get to sleep and you know get off your phone later. Like that stuff really is significantly correlated with um, some injury risk. Okay, so not rates, but you know sleep quality and stress management and proper fueling and proper hydration. That stuff is massively important. So. Um, if you're having a lot of those issues outside the gym and someone is really struggling with overuse injuries or issues like that, you know, that's clearly a bigger thing you have to deal with. Okay. So culture, communication, training plans, workloads, um, outside the gym stuff, sleep, hydration, nutrition. And then for me, the other one, I, I really believe, I think Mike Boyle said this, that one of the best injury uh, prevention, quote unquote programs he had in quotes, is just a good strength and conditioning program. So I really do firmly believe, uh, that like a proper strength program, uh, having really good technique having really good basics and really taking time to do those things well um, consistently is probably the most important uh, base layer you have around some of the things I just said. So it's not that I don't like these prehab circuits and that I don't do it, but you have to be strong to tolerate gymnastics. You have to have good basics. You have to have good round off technique and understand the basics of skills. You can't just kind of be flopping around and, you know, throwing yourself through the air for really hard tricks with high forces and expect that because I did my ankle exercises or because I did my lower back stuff, you know, no injuries are going to come up. So yeah, I just want to spend the first 10 minutes of this podcast kind of outlining those things because without that, I think it's hard to understand maybe what the role of prehab is. And so the next thing I have here is essentially just five categories of things that I really think about that are important. And I'll kind of share what that category is, you know, why I feel that way, and maybe a couple of studies that have shown some benefit to, um, you know, why it's important to think about this. And then essentially, um, this is kind of how I outline circuits or how I kind of put things together. So the first thing I think that a lot of people know with prehab is going to be just some sort of like soft tissue and or like mobility or flexibility care. And this is kind of beyond just normal warm ups and normal stuff like that. And, and people may ask why that's necessary. And so one concept here that we know from baseball and um, running and golf and some others is that if you only kind of particularly focus on doing one sport for multiple uh, days, multiple weeks, multiple months out of the year, there's a lot of repetition in that sport. Okay. And so sometimes what happens is that doing the same motion over and over and over and over um, can kind of cause over the course of a season, uh, a reduction in your flexibility or a reduction in your range of motion. So baseball is probably the most famous example that I've obviously taken a lot of work from because my boss is working pro baseball. But if you watch uh, somebody throw a baseball over and over and over again, you can actually see measurable changes in their overhead flexibility and the ability of their arm to rotate in called internal rotation. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. But essentially, the thought process is that as the season goes on, we do see substantial changes in the, that flexibility. And if you lose that flexibility, well, then it might start to put some stress on other areas in the elbow. It, that's what it particularly comes up in baseball is that limited overhead flexibility over the course of a season sometimes correlates with more uh, risk of crankiness in the elbow, the Tommy John ligament. So um, with that said, you know, why that happens is a lot of possible factors, you know, maybe someone simply is just doing their sport more and they're not spending enough time on stretching and foam rolling and dynamic warmups, they're kind of skipping some of that, you know, maybe just true trauma to the muscle that causes the muscle to get stiff over time. And it kind of like over time, gets really, really overworked. And maybe it's just the same muscle group over and over and over again. Um, the other thing is like a lot of younger athletes are growing, you know what I mean? So maybe it's nothing to do with only the sport in the season. Maybe it's just the fact that a lot of, you know, 
seven to 12 year old gymnast and baseball players and whoever, um, they're running uphill at trying to, you know, the bones grow much faster than their, uh, uh, muscles can sometimes keep up with, which is why growing pains sometimes are a thing, but maybe that's it, you know? So there's a lot of kind of possible, you know, uh, theories you could kind of brainstorm on. Um, but essentially we have to remember that high level sports, uh, as you get more and more into it, gymnastics, baseball, you know, Olympic weightlifting is a thousand here, like football, a lot of these sports, um, to, to run and jump and sprint and do the skills required diving comes to mind. Um, it does require a lot of range of motion. And so what can sometimes happen here is this crossroads between, you're trying to gain range of motion and maintain that range of motion to do your skills, jumps, leaps, um, you know, vaulting, um, high bar skills, pommel horse arms behind your back, and you're getting stiffer, you know, as the season goes on. And I think that's where things start to be problematic is because then you start to either, you know, put a lot of stress on other areas of the body In gymnastics. A common one is that if your shoulders get really stiff as the season or years go on, your back sometimes bends more and it can cause some back pain. Um, same thing with some of the ankle flexibility issues. If you either have old ankle injuries or you have a lot of like high stiffness in your calves because of how much toe pointing goes on and jumping and running, uh, it might make it really hard to squat. And that might put some pressure on your back or on your knees when you're trying to absorb really high forces. So the, the kind of punchline here is that understanding this, we want to try to do our best to be proactively taking care of this more than just, you know, the dynamic warm up. And I think I can't say, uh, you know, this is a high quality RCT study, but we've looked at some people in um, at our facility in our research lab, research lab, our, our force plates and our, our tables, I should say, um, is that gymnastics pre and post season does show some of these changes. So we looked at like seven or eight NCAA athletes before the season, they all went out to their schools, all different schools came back and we measured them all after. And there was a significant amount of uh, flexibility loss in these athletes, right? So shoulders in particular, overhead flexibility, um, hip flexibility as well, groin, quad, and it makes sense, right? You're like running and jumping and using your arms for like every day, multiple hours throughout the entire season. So um, I think with that being said, what we want to do is try to be proactive here. And there's a lot of options here, right? You can do um, soft tissue work with foam rolling 30 to 60 seconds every day. You can do some specific stretching for your shoulders. You can do some specific stuff for your hips and your hamstrings and your quads. Um, there's a lot of options here. You can just kind of do more dynamic mobility work than you would normally do. I think the, there's a lot of options here and I'll share some of my favorites here in a moment. But I think that the research that has, has come out has shown that it's really about consistency, right? So uh, for soft tissue work and flexibility work, you probably do want to do this, you know, uh, multiple days per week. So, you know, I, I think in an ideal world, I would recommend people five to six days per week for 30 to 60 seconds per muscle group with maybe like a moderate amount of discomfort is probably a good, you know, uh, kind of principle to, to aim for in terms of dosage. Um, I think it's, it's something that doesn't need to be obsessed with, but it's also something that has to kind of have a box checked every day. And again, maybe we're just preventing the further decline. Maybe we're actually making range of motion improvement. If somebody can get, you know, specific hands-on manual therapy, like a sports massage for their lats or their teres major, their rotator cuff area, their, you know, quads, their hamstrings. If that stuff is helpful, that's cool. People use like vibration, vibration guns now, which is another option too as well. I think more so the idea is just about doing something that is helpful, right? It's not about what is the golden answer. It's about uh, making sure that the areas that are commonly overused and stiff um, are, are getting targeted, you know, every day, every other day, something like that. So for me personally, I think that the lats and the Terry's major and gymnasts and the pecs are probably big ones. So lacrosse ball in the back of the shoulder to Terry's major, foam rolling under the arms, um, softball to the front of the pec and the chest to try to get that. I think thoracic spine gets overlooked too. So extensions over a thoracic, uh, thoracic extensions over a foam roller, um, windmills, which are kind of like rotations, hands and knees, uh, hands and knees, quadruped turns. Those are great. Their thoracic mobility. I think a lot of times the groin and the quads and the hip flexors of gymnasts get very overworked due to the nature of jumps and leaps and running and squeezing your legs together. So, you know, foam rolling your groin, foam rolling your quad, getting a proper true hip flexor and quad stretch. Um, adductor rocks or groin rocks. These are all really, really good things that you can do. Calf work is another one that's really, really helpful. You know, basic lacrosse ball work, getting a vibration gun in there, stretching against the wall, ankle rockers at the wall, just something, you know, something every day. And maybe you have, you know, an old ankle injury and you know, your shoulders are stiff. And so one day you kind of focus for 10 minutes on your ankles in a, in a little circuit. And then one day you focus maybe on shoulders uh, along with your dynamic warm up every single day. So yeah, I think that that's, uh, you know, just some basics there of, of some things that I think are do are good to do. Um, soft tissue work is very important. I think that mobility work is very important. I wouldn't get obsessed with it. I wouldn't spend 45 minutes, you know, rolling every single nook and cranny of your calf muscle. But I think getting, you know, 30 to 60 seconds, like I said, per muscle group, you know, in a little circuit of things you need beyond just your normal uh, dynamic warm up is very important, right? On the backdrop of that, you're actually sleeping, you're actually eating well and enough, you're, you're hydrating yourself, you're 
doing all that kind of stuff because that is the most important for like muscle recovery if you're sore or if you are um, feeling some stiffness develop over time. Um, but with those in mind, you can then kind of step back and say, like, all right, what else can I do here? You know, that might be helpful. So that's the first category. Um, the second category I think is really important is kind of uh, become a little bit less culturally, you know, thought about, but it's just like isolated joint strength. And so what I mean by that is like directly strengthening the muscles around a joint that that do a lot of work in your sport. So there's obviously strength and conditioning and like gymnastics specific strength, right? rope climbs, hand, handstands, leg lifts, like you're doing that kind of work. But what I'm talking about more is like specific joint stuff. So um, the rotator cuff, right? The muscles around the shoulder that are very, very important for keeping the shoulder, you know, attached to your body. Um, but also things like your uh, hip, like you know, your, your hip has some really uh, important muscles down in there, your glutes, um, and some of the hip rotators that oftentimes don't get directly strengthened. They don't get like a hypertrophy approach. They don't get like a true strength building circuit. They kind of just get like activation and or balance work, um, which is important. Um, but I also think like the calves are really important. The shins are really important. Some of the deeper core muscles that sometimes don't get like a bracing strategy taught. I think those things are really, really important. I think my personal opinion on this is that the pendulum has swung pretty hard from 10 years ago when I was just getting out of school, like the late nineties had a lot of isolation work. And then came like the kind of quote unquote functional movement swing, which was very important for us to learn. And it was super helpful about how the joints work together and what like squatting versus lunging versus backbending does and all that kind of stuff and what's involved. But then with that, I think a lot of people started to train in like functional patterns and kind of do very specific compound movements, which are awesome. And with that, unfortunately, I think we kind of lost sight on there is a role to play for direct strengthening, right? And I think that's one thing that's kind of interesting to see the disconnect on is uh, many people will take the rehabilitation exercises and use them preventatively in their mind. But then again, they look at what we do sometimes with like a shoulder rehab, right? For shoulder rehab for the second month, if you have like either a surgery or an injury, it's just like boring grunt work, right? You're doing like specific dumbbell work. You're doing a lot of strengthening work. It's hard. It's really hard, but we're trying to strengthen and gain hypertrophy and gain uh, a lot of, you know, muscle tone in those areas because they're really important for sports. And I think that's what sometimes people forget is that we do a lot of isolation work. After a, for example, a knee surgery, you might do some quad sets and some activation work with like a stim unit to get your ACL, you know, your quads back together. But you're really quickly starting to do some like direct quad extensions, hamstring curls, you know, like really, really hard, but important direct strengthening work. And so, yeah, I think we need to find a balance here between the compound stuff, the fun stuff, the fancy stuff, and just some of the boring grunt work. And then when you, you take a step back and you realize why it's important, gymnastics and the shoulders are a really good example. You know, you don't want a, a relatively strong shoulder, your deltoids, your pecs, your lats are really strong. They're great. And then have a rotator cuff that is really not strong comparatively, right? And so what happens is when you hang on a bar really hard, when you're swinging and the forces are two, three, four times body weight, you know, going through your shoulders, what do you think is going to be the thing that maybe starts to get cranky first? It's probably going to be, you know, some of those smaller rotator cuff muscles, those tendons that are getting overloaded just by a just simple equation of force. So we really want to make sure, particularly for like men's gymnastics, that we are being aggressive in terms of strengthening that area directly and getting that area to be continually strong along with the rest of your body. So, and the, and the shoulder, it's like the, the, uh, I don't want to go super geeky, but the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, like we know these muscles typically get underloaded and they're also really, really important for reducing the risk of overload on the shoulder. Right. So that's really important to think about is direct isolated strength work to the shoulder, right. Or direct isolated strength work to uh, the glute me, the outside of the hip, the deep hip rotators, because sometimes you will get you know, smaller exercise or more less challenging exercises like yellow band side band walks or yellow band rotator cuff stuff. And it's good for a warm up. It's good for early after someone's coming back from an injury. I use them as well. But expecting those things at weeks four, six, eight, 12 to get you strong is not really going to be effective. So use the bands as your warm up and stuff, but then you should carve out time twice per week to like really be hitting it hard, right? Like really getting after a good shoulder circuit with dumbbells and with heavy bands and with different work to try to get those muscles stronger. So I personally recommend to people that two times a week, you probably want some sort of direct isolated work in a, in a good like hypertrophy type of way. So two to three sets, maybe eight to 12, you know, with a moderate weight that by the end of it, you're like, Ooh, I'm like my shoulders cooked, you know, like my hips are burning, like this is good. Um, we don't want to like make someone go completely exhausted and that's going to be tough to do with those types of weights. But um, we do want to kind of get over that myth that, you know, it's a small muscle. 
um, that is a stabilizer. So we're just going to go two sets of like 15 to 20 reps and just burn it out for endurance. Um, as my boss and Mike Ronald, you know, fam famously says is that weak muscles can't stabilize. So you really have to get that raw level of strength and power up first before you can ask that muscle to stabilize or do an endurance circuit or something like that. And a lot of sports like gymnastics have extremely high forces on the shoulders, extremely high forces on the legs. So we do want some isolated work. And I think it's very, very appropriate. So that's the second thing that's oftentimes in my mind for some prehab work um, is to try to get some direct loading to build capacity of these individual muscles and tendons that are probably a little bit underlooked in some other stuff. And kind of on that concept of, of underlooked, I think that's where the concept of strength and conditioning balance comes. And I think this is another really popular topic that has come more into the limelight uh, because people are realizing it's, a, it's you know, you don't want to get too sport specific. Um, I think a lot of times we do our sport. It's fun. It's exciting. And what happens is that you tend to get a lot of really, really good, strong muscles that are powerful and you want that. But then over the course of a season or over the course of maybe, you know, multiple months of training cycles, we really don't have an equal uh, amount of balance for other areas that are super important. And in gymnastics, the one that always comes up as first is going to be the upper back, right? Because we just talked about the rotator cuff, but also your scapular muscles, your upper back muscles are massively important for holding handstands, for throwing your arms back to the table, for not buckling when you, you know, hit the table and want to go the other way, for throwing a bar for a shapash or throwing your arms for a back handspring or a back walkover, like really getting that open shoulder angle. Yes, you need flexibility. And yes, you do need strength to push up into the floor of the apparatus to not collapse your handstand. But you really need a strong upper back to get those shoulders open and be able to handle some of the forces of tumbling, backhand springs, beam, um, men's parallel bars, and high bar. So I think sometimes what happens is we do a ton of push-ups and a ton of pull-ups and a ton of rope climbs and a ton of handstand push-ups. And we have three out of the four motions, right? Like up and down vertically and then pushing forward and horizontally. But we completely forget about rowing backwards, right? And so what happens is we either have exercises that look like they're doing it, but they're really more for your lats. Um, or we have just not enough uh, raw, you know, volume of those things. So I think it's really important that people are adding in specific uh, into their strength and conditioning program or a prehab circuit or whatever, some really good challenging upper back exercises. And I think maybe I don't know, one, two days per week is good if you have it in a strength program, but I feel like two is a really safe bet for me. So the ones that I really like the most are going to be face pulls, um, feet elevated, horizontal rows, renegade rows, um, anything that involves just directly pulling in this horizontal vector with your elbows slightly higher. If the elbows are close by our side, sometimes the lats are doing most of the work, which is fine if you want to get strong. But we're trying to bring ourselves up a little bit to about 60 to 70 degrees of elevation to get middle trap, lower trap, uh, rhomboids, and all that kind of stuff. And there's obviously a little bit of overlap there between the rotator cuff exercises and some of the upper back exercises. Like my boss has done really good uh, EMG studies on how like prone T's, prone Y's, prone U's are going to get lower trap and maybe some middle trap activation as well. But then you look at like the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research and doing like really good face pulls or seal rows or some feet elevated rows in the proper technique is a lot of really good like middle trap and rhomboids and scapular muscles between the shoulders that oftentimes don't get looked at as well. So I think it's a balance there, right? You want to have really good cuff work, but you also want to have upper back work. And then another area of the body that's really, again, overlooked is going to be just directly training the glutes and the hamstrings. Gymnastics is really good at squat jumps and single leg jumps and jumps on a resi mat and then jumps on a springboard, then more jumps over here. And a lot of that becomes like quad, 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 which is super important to get really strong quads. I don't want to say it's not, but if you have extremely strong quads and extremely strong adductors, but your hamstrings and your glutes are hanging on for dear life, that can be problematic for, for many different reasons, performance and also, you know, overload injury risk. So um, hamstrings sometimes get more love, you know, physio ball curl-ins or um, hamstring sliders or stuff like that, which is cool. But, you know, a good old fashioned single leg dumbbell RDL, you know, is, is really, really good. And so that's one of the best things we know EMG wise will develop the hamstrings. And a lot of people don't do it because they're a little nervous about it. But also the one that was most mind blowing to me, and I had a massive face palm moment when I learned about it was just doing single leg weighted hip lifts, right? So you're laying on your back, your shoulders are a glute bridge. Some people call them shoulder blades are up on a, a small panel mat or a box to kind of make it more parallel to the ground. And we're not just going to do a, a body weight single leg glute lift. We're going to put weights over our hips. We're going to put a dumbbell on our hip. We're going to make this really challenging, right? So we're really directly loading the glute max, right? In particular, which what do you think opens your hips up for a back handsprings or opens your hip up when you're trying to sprint really fast or get you off the floor into a nice hip open position for a, a back tuck or a back layout or a double double, right? Or opens your hips when you're throwing for strapash or opens your hips when you're at the bottom for a tap on giants. Like that is a really important thing to develop. And so it's one thing to have a lot of 
hip flexor and quad and groin mobility, it's another thing to have an extremely strong set of hamstrings and glutes to back that up. And so that's why I think it's really important that people are either in their strength program or elsewhere doing direct hip lifts, uh, side plank clamshells, they're doing uh, single leg RDLs, they're doing uh, Nordic tree falls, which are kneeling, kind of lowering yourself down for your hamstrings. Like we know these exercises are really, really good for your hips, right? For your hamstrings, for your glutes. I think split squats are also a really good carry over here to a little bit of glute and quad. So that's something I would really recommend people do also is again, like three to four sets of like, you know, maybe six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, somewhere in that range, because we're trying to get a lot more strength, not just only hypertrophy. So maybe eight is probably a good rep for most people. Um, but some of those things are, are variable and you want to do those because you want that strength balance, right? So if we have good soft tissue care, good mobility work, we have some isolated uh, joint strength as well. And then we have some strength balance around the joint. We're setting the stage for a really good opportunity to hopefully reduce the risk of overload injuries to that area. Okay. So that's the third thing. The fourth thing, which I think a lot of people know, and this is what most people are doing for prehab is either like some sort of like uh, reactive balance work or control. The fancy term that we use in the medical world is dynamic stability, which is, you know, I think control in the presence of change is like the real dorky way people say it. Um, but essentially it's just like, can you maintain uh, balance and, you know, kind of like stationary uh, body position in reaction to change. Right. But also can you quickly react and kind of have like quick motions to, to uh, react to, should your balance be off? Should you fall off one side or should you be more forward or more backwards. So a lot of people already do these, which is like balance pad uh, work or, uh, you know, sorts of type like stability work, they'll call it or some sort of like earthquake bar. Um, and I think this is awesome, right? I do think the concept is great. But for me, it's not as important as the first three, you know, I think they're all important. But the strength and the isolated work and that kind of stuff was really important as a foundation. And then we can add on some dynamic stability work or some control work. And I think, you know, it's not only about raw strength in gymnastics and other sports, right? You do have to kind of understand reactive work. Um, it's called rate of force development or impulse, what some people call it, like that quick reaction speed um, that you have to either when you're balance check on beam, or you're a little bit off on parallel bars or a little bit off on your landing on floor, you know, you can take a quick step or you can balance on one leg. You can kind of pick your chest up real fast. That's essentially what we're trying to train is, is trying to get someone to be quicker and reactive and have that good balance, that kind of like ability to handle some of those errors. And so I think there's a lot, a, a large range of stuff. The majority of things that people are thinking about rightfully so are in the lower body. Um, so, you know, uh, standing on a foam pad and doing some, some rebound balls and having somebody tap you maybe, or closing your eyes, right? That stuff is really cool. So I do enjoy doing those, but I also think there's another big role here to kind of overlap with some of the stuff from the last category and knowing that by doing some single leg work or changing the way that we're doing an exercise, we can kind of put it more in the balance or more in the dynamic stability bucket and less in the strength bucket. And the best example I have for this for the legs is like a, it's like a deadlift, right? Or a single leg RDL. So if you just do a double legged, stiff legged RDL, you're very much taking away all the challenge of balance and you're putting it all in strength, right? Like you can lift more weight. You can do a lot more loading to the hamstrings on two legs or even one leg too. We'll talk about the kickstand, but two legs with two dumbbells doing RDLs is going to be a really hard challenge strength wise on the hamstring. Now, if we move that to a single leg version, right? So a kickstand, a kickstand would be one leg is flat. The other leg is really just back there for a little bit of balance. It's maybe 75% of the weights on the front leg. 25% of the weights on the back leg. And you're really just using that kickstand for a little bit more balance, but you're on a single leg with two RDLs or sorry, two dumbbells doing a single leg kickstand RDL. It's kind of balanced, right? You do have to balance a little bit, but it's also more so at single leg strength work on the front leg. So it's not as, uh, you know, stationary and static as a double leg deadlift, but you are getting a little bit of balance, but you have weight in two hands and you're really loading up that RDL heavy. So that's going to be a little bit more of a crossover between a little bit of an RDL that's balance based and a little bit of an RDL that's a little bit more strength based. And then on the far end of that spectrum, if you really wanted to do something that was re for reactive control and dynamic stability of the leg, you would do a single leg RDL. So now one leg is down, the other leg is up in the air, and you are only putting a heavier weight in the opposite hand. So my right leg is down, the weight's in my left hand. So now when I do an RDL, I've turned that into much more of a three-dimensional thing. I have to control my hips going side to side. I have to control my hips rotating, and I also have to control that front to back motion. So now this is really a, a quite a bit more balance-based exercise or dynamic stability-based exercise, right? So single leg RDL, left hand has the weight, right hand's on the ground. Sorry, right foot's on the ground, left foot's up in the air balancing. That's a lot of balance work, right? That's not limited by strength. That's probably limited by balance. And then you go even one step further and you start to play around with things like balance pads, right? Catching a ball on a balance pad, tapping a cone or doing a water wall, which is half full with water and then water sloshes around. You're like really far out there on the dynamic stability curve, right? Which is awesome if that's the intended goal. But just realize there that you can go all the way from a double leg RDL, which is very strength-based to a middle point, which is half and half 
to a really far dynamic stability base. And I think that's the important thing, the concept here, the takeaway is that if you want to do dynamic stability drills, we have to make it in that bucket, but also just make it just challenging enough on their balance, right? You don't want to have somebody on a balance pad getting stuff thrown at them with bands all over the place and they're trying to catch on a BOSU ball. Like it gets so crazy so fast. What happens is that person just locks up into a massive stiffness strategy. They contract everything in their body to try to not move at all. And it kind of defeats the purpose of nuanced balance and control. Okay. So that's really, really important. The other area I think this, this carries a lot to in the lower body is jumping and landing drills. And this is actually a really good area of research we have some information on, which is, you know, Tim Hewitt, for example, has shown that you can have a massive reduction in ACL risk, not rate, risk in young females in particular, if they're taught to land properly in a proper squat pattern, and they get really, really strong, and then transfer that into coordination, right? So what I mean by that is like, understanding where should my toes, my knees and my hips be when I squat, it's called like neuromuscular education. We have to know how to squat, but then also when we jump onto one leg and can we control that squat? Can we maintain our balance so that our, our trunk isn't tipping over or our knees not caving in or stuff like that? Because that's the mechanism for a lot of ACL tears is a very high impulse dynamic impact where the leg is quickly moving in and out and it causes stress on the ACL. So Tim has shown phenomenal work in like a meta analysis of a meta analysis, which is like super high level uh, tier of research with really good data that teaching proper landing patterns on two legs and one leg, getting them really, really strong back to my points above, and then teaching those drills that are very quick reactive landings. That actually is a, a useful thing we know has decent research behind reducing the risk of, you know, uh, uh, an ACL tear or something traumatic like that. So we want to use that, right? We can use some single leg jump and lands off a box in a mirror. We can use some single leg jump quarter turns and try to land and stick, right? Jump quarter turns stick for ankle as well. And I think that's another area that we've seen some good research too is on Achilles tendinopathy, direct loading of the Achilles is really, really helpful. But we also do want to try to understand how to maintain that uh, plyometric ability and not overload somebody before they get too far down the rabbit hole in season. So we can use these dynamic stability drills, these loading drills as a good way to do this. And this is why it's a fourth category of things I really, really like, which is it does have all these elements. Now we have some flexibility, we have some isolated strength, we have some balance, we have some control, some dynamic stability. We're trying to kind of just tease apart all these different things that are important for the sport and then put them into maybe some drills that are specific to what they're doing. The other area I think sometimes does not get enough love is the upper body for these kind of dynamic stability stuff. So gymnastics is weird that we go on our hands, right? So we do need a lot of balance work, nuance control on one hand for P bars, for example, pirouetting skills, stuff like that. And for me, I like, this is where I really like things like kettlebells and like loaded carries, right? Like for sure, handstand holds are awesome and stuff like that, but holding a bottom up kettlebell, which means that you're flipping the kettlebell upside down. So the handle's being held, but the bell is straight up. That causes quite a bit of, you know, wobble factor. And we like that, right? So so bottoms up kettlebell carries at 90 degrees overhead Turkish getups that are maybe not bottoms up, but are just flat, right? We really do like that because the shoulders moving all over the place and you're having to kind of control that at a subconscious level. So I use a lot of loaded carries for the upper body as well. Crawling is also another really good way to do bear crawls front to back, side to side, uh, which has good carryover for like, you know, lower back core control. Those things I think are really, really important. And that's the last thing I'll end on is, you know, the lower back gets a lot of uh, questions about injuries, stuff like that. And while a lot of lower back pain stuff, in my opinion, comes down to workload management and reps and volume of back extensions and back bending and landings and stuff like that. One thing that is very helpful, I think, to teach athletes is how to brace and breathe properly. So can you brace your core in a nice neutral position? Do you know how to keep that while taking deep breaths and not, you know, holding your breath for, for dear life, but also then moving your arms and your legs around that stable base. So when you, when you jump for a back handspring, do you know how to brace your core, but open your shoulders and your upper back and your hips to kind of spread spread that bend throughout the entire body. Do you know when you land a heavy dismount, you can brace your core, but then properly squat, right? That thing, those things do help for, in my opinion, to reduce the risk of overload to the lower back because teaching someone this kind of reactive control or this bracing strategy is in that kind of like, I guess, neuromuscular education bucket some would put in this dynamic stability area. So teaching someone how to land your back into a bird dog or a dead bug or a bear crawl or a side plank uh, is really, really important to brace and breathe. Now, that being said, if it only lives on the floor and it never becomes a med ball slam or a sled push or a plyometric drill, I think that's leaving it too short, right? You actually have to teach the basics and use them in your warmups, but then transfer those things over to jumping and landing and sprinting and skills. It's a marriage of both of those things, which I think makes it really, really good. So, all right. And then lastly here, just to wrap things up is I think the next thing we have to really uh, keep in mind is that we don't do these things in isolations, right? The reason we're doing these is for sport specific things, right? So we do want to make sure that some of this stuff does actually show up in the sport we're doing 
which is gymnastics, right? So it's one thing to do all these great circuits and have all these exercises and all that kind of stuff. But if we just say like, okay, good luck, just do these exercises and hope they show up, it's probably not going to just magically do it. So I personally like to be doing a lot of different, um, you know, specific drills that are gymnastics based that probably people would already use, you know, for some of their, you know, um, day to day warm ups or day to day, you know, side stations. I think it's really important to try to make sure we transfer these things over. So uh, the example that I just used is probably the best one, right, which is like the backbending example, right. So if we're working on our shoulder flexibility, and we're doing some isolated strength work to our lower back and our core, we have good balance where we're doing that glute training, well, we really want to make sure that all those things show up when we backbend, show up when we use your show up when we actually tap on high bar. So we want to use some drills where we're trying to teach athletes, open your hips, open your shoulders, brace that core, maybe a tall kneeling backbend, tapping the wall for back, lower back issues, right? Maybe it's going to be get really dynamic tap swings on um, high bar or on strap bar or fish swings, they call them when you are hollow. And you're trying to teach someone how to transfer this over to gymnastics for a lot of stuff in the hips, right? It's a lot of active flexibility work. It's band lifts, it's kicks, it's jumps, right? It's jump drills, right? It's turn drills where we're saying, Hey, use, use that glute muscle, really activate that glute, push that hip open, stand up nice and tall, right? Push up on relevé. use that calf strength that we're trying to build. You want to actually have that show up. And then obviously the most, you know, maybe, um, open-minded one that comes to everyone's uh, category is just landing, right? Like when you land a back tuck, try to actually land like the way we practice in the mirror uh, in warmups or, you know, punch, 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 then jump front tuck land. When you're punching, do your gymnastic specific bounding. And when you do a front tuck, but when you land, let's squat properly, right? Because the rules are changing now for this. So anything you can think of landing, um, bar swings, pommel horse, open circles, um, back bending, all those things have really good sport specific options that you can use. And I think that is part of prehab for me too, which is giving someone some more shoulder flexibility, some strength, some specific strength balance or some control, and then going over and doing some single leg jump and lands on beam or doing some jumps and leaps on the floor and working on landing problems and look, looking at the mirror and saying like, okay, we need to change our need to come over here or something like that. So that's really important to me. So yeah, I think I tried to do it in 40 minutes and I, I got close to it. Uh, 45 minutes was the goal here. So uh, that's just a lot of ideas that, you you know, come from my brain and my experiences. I will say when we end this episode that a lot of people reach out to us and ask like, what circuits do you use? What things do you think are really important? And I kind of want to mention that is that we are releasing new prehab guides that people can literally just print out and put in a binder and bring to their gym. We wanted to make something over time that was useful, that had some, some decent ideas behind it, and that it wasn't super complicated. So I listened to a lot of feedback from the community. I said, like, well, what do you want? And they were like, oh, I just want a PDF that I can print out and put in a binder and, and hang on the wall or, or bring whatever. So yeah, and then other people said, we want something digital. I want to be able to click and watch and, and watch a video and read a thing and do all that. So we did both. So this is kind of what we have coming out uh, at the, the, when this episode comes out, they're alive now. Um, but essentially we made um, all collections of prehab circuits that people can use. So there's this one, which has all of them. There's like six different guides. And so this one goes through an introduction, but essentially it does what people want, which is like, here's an A-day circuit that you can print out for the ankle and just slap it on the wall. There's a picture here that people can be taught. And then this is like a little reminder. This is just the basic version. But also, uh, if you go down really far, there's an index where it has a little bit more of an in-depth uh, explanation of these things. So here's the same ankle circuit, but now it's in long form circuit. So maybe you have in the, in the front of the binder, it's just ankle A, B, C, knee A, B, C, and it goes all the way down. They can flip the pages, but if they're confused, they can jump to the back of this index and they can say, oh yeah, this is how I foam roll my calves. Oh yeah, this is seated shin races, right? So this is just for the simply, the everyday coach, the everyday parent, the everyday gymnast who just wants a quick thing to have, you know, when they want to do circuits, but they don't know what to do. So I tried to make it as simple and as basic as possible, not super complicated. Um, so we have this one, which has all of them. If you want to grab them all in like uh, one like little package PDF and just print them all out. But we also know some people just want one or two. So we made a separate ankle sheet over here. We have a separate lower back one. So there's one for the ankle, the knee, the hip, the lower back, the shoulder, and then the elbow and the wrist because those are together. And then also I do want to mention, um, some people wanted digital versions that they could have like on an iPad in a gym and they want the kids to be able to pull up a YouTube video and actually see what the exercise is or they want to learn it. So these things are um, also digital. So here, you know, under each one, you can actually click on these things and it will bring up a uh, YouTube um, that I'll pull over real quick. So you can just click on the actual, um, you know, uh, text here. And this will, this blue text will bring up the actual exercise. And we thought that that was a really good way for people to have both, right? So some people are digital. They want to click this button, see the video, follow along, do this for 30 seconds, and then click the next one and then move along. So that's fine. But other people literally just want to print these out and put them in the gym or have them in a binder or leave them on their phone and just follow these. So 
We try to make three circuits that kind of go through what I just talked about, which is soft tissue work, flexibility, uh, strength work, um, strength balance, um, balance work. It's like you can hear, see here, uh, Taylor doing some uh, ball rebounders against the wall. That's kind of more of that dynamic stability drill for like an ankle circuit. So we tried to put in something for that. And I essentially made three for each thing, three for the ankle, three for the knee, three for the hip, three for whatever. So if you're interested in that and you want something for your gym, um, we just try to listen to what people need help with. And this is what we got. So you can uh, grab them now if you're interested. Uh, it's just uh, shiftmovementscience.com backslash prehab. And you can buy the one that's uh, uh, all together. They're very cheap. I tried to make them as dirt cheap as possible. These ones, I think individually are like 20 bucks, like under 20 bucks, because we're just trying to help people out to get what they need. Um, and it obviously just cover the cost of, of making them. So yeah, people wanted them. They said they were helpful. And I'm happy that I could provide some information. So um, that's all we're going to end with today is that if you want to buy those circuits and toss them into your binder or toss them at the gym and kind of, uh, you know, do the hand wash and just follow along with some circuits that you have shift movement science.com uh, backslash prehab. But if you just want to listen to this episode and soak up the information and get a better understanding of what to do, then that is cool too. Um, I hope everyone is doing well. I hope you guys are uh, enjoying the start of the new year when this comes out and uh, yeah, keep an eye out because shift has some very exciting things coming in the next couple months. And uh, I can't spill the beans just yet, <laughs> but hope you're all well. And I hope you guys all have a great day. Take care.